as we begin to start the program, if you would silence all portable devices, close all laptops. Thank you. If you gentlemen would move in as swiftly as possible so we can start. Good morning, everyone. God is good and all the time. So God is good and all the time. Thank you, my brothers. One, uh, I use that affirmation when I start speeches mostly because for those of you who haven't had the opportunity, that forces me to take a pause. It forces me to remember that it's because of his grace and his mercy that we get the privilege of being here in Morehouse College. And so I hopefully, as we say that together, that you also remind yourself that it's Lord above that has blessed us with our abundant gifts and it made it possible for us to be here. Well, today is a very special day. John Maxwell has a book called The 21 Essential Qualities of Leadership. But the number one thing that Maxwell says that leadership is influence. Nothing more, nothing less. But well, we're fortunate today to be here for the Student Government Association Ground Forum when we celebrate those student leaders who have given up their time and their talents to lead you, the student body here at Morehouse College. At this time, we will have a prayer from Mr. Colin Beckford, Student Government Association Treasurer. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, at this time, could you please assume the posture of prayer? Almighty God, we pause to thank you for everything you have given us at times we feel we don't deserve. For unmerited favor and brand new mercies, thank you. For waking us up this morning, for letting us see one more dawning, we say thank you. As I offer up thanksgiving for all you are doing for us now, I ask that you bless our student leaders in the SGA and every organization on this campus. Daily, please remind us that before we can become glorified leaders who sometimes relish our titles more than our obligations, we must first be dutiful servants to the will of the student and the way of the master. I ask that you bless President Franklin and his administration with the wisdom and management of our institution with the strength to press on towards their goals and a desire to see every wrong corrected, every complaint resolved, and every student successful. Grant us a safe and productive school year. Give us the ability to focus more on our daily responsibilities than our nightly rewards. Help us to be better students of the classroom and of life and allow us to learn from and grow with each other. And so now, may the faith of the May the faith we put in chairs to hold us, brakes to stop us, maps to guide us, and medicines to cure us be also given in an unyielding way to the God who woke us up this morning and got us here on time. And the people said, Amen. Amen. It is my pleasure to introduce you to an outstanding young man whom you all know very well. A two-time, a rare feat he has accomplished, two-time Student Government Association president. He leads the student body in an outstanding manner. He's very visible. His energy, his, his energy and enthusiasm is contagious. And when I see him on the yard, I refer to him as Mr. President. Ladies and gentlemen, our Student Government Association president, Mr. Travis Randall.
Good morning, brothers. The SGA Crown Forum is a once a year occasion where we recognize the work and achievements of our elected student leaders. Gentlemen, the work of advocacy is not easy. The gentlemen who sit behind me and some in the audience commit hundreds of hours every week, long nights and mental energy in attempting to find solutions to the problems that we face. Now, student leaders have often been criticized because long after the campaigns are over, we often do not see the tangible results of progress, the, the progress of their labor. However, at Morehouse, we face a few stark realities that stand as a hindrance to this progress. The college is coping with an, with an economic climate toxic to a small private college, not blessed with an endowment or financial war chest compared to our counterparts. We are witnessing the college in transition as our esteemed president focuses the whole institution on his vision for our beloved school. And even in the student body, we have engaged in our own debate regarding the purpose, the role, and the effectiveness of our student government. Needless to say, brothers, there's a lot going on. However, no matter what obstacles lay before us, the voice and the interest of the student body must and will be heard at every level of decision making here at the college. In addition to recognition of student leadership, the SGA Crown Forum has traditionally been the only school sanctioned platform outside of Welcome to the House where the SJ president has been allowed to speak. However, last year in my first term as president, this privilege was stripped away. And again in my second term, I've been denied the privilege of serving as the keynote speaker of this SGA Crown Forum. In the past, I voiced my opposition to this decision and I will again so this year. However, the ability of the president to stand in this sacred place and to lay out his vision for the student body provides a level of gravity and legitimacy to his voice. But I'm pleased to note that one of my predecessors and current state representative Bakari Sellers will speak before this assembly today. Brothers, sit back, relax, and enjoy today's program. Thank you. And I made my first mistake. <laughs> Gentlemen, I want to introduce you all to your Student Government Association for the 2011-2012 academic year. Number one, the first on the platform, Mr. A.J. Symington, Attorney General. Please stand. Mr. Trevon McKay, our new Secretary for Information Technology. Mr. Tevin Jones, Event Director for the SGA. Mr. Chase Mayo, Executive Secretary. Mr. Paul Anthony Daniels, Chief of Staff to the SGA. Mr. Chad Foster, Senior Board Trustee. Mr. Colin Beckford, Treasurer of the SGA. Mr. Dijon Hall, our esteemed Vice President of the SGA. Mr. Boris DeBrevage, Junior Board Trustee. Mr. Tari Alexander, Corresponding Secretary. Mr. Edward Anderson, Senate President Pro Temp. Mr. Dontavius Taylor, Chairman of the Student Welfare and Concerns Committee. And Mrs. Shagun Idu, Chairman of the Constitution and Bylaws Committee. <clears throat> are there any other SJ officials in the audience today? If, you, if they are, please stand. Gentlemen, please give them a round of applause. Oh, yeah. 
Thank you for the Glee Club Quartet under the direction of Dr. David Morrow. Ladies and gentlemen, uh, a few minutes ago, President Randall had the opportunity to introduce the members of the Student Government Association. And uh, you politely, you politely, a few of you clapped. Gentlemen, could I get you to stand one more time for me? Folks, we all are good at throwing arrows. But these young men, these young men have the courage, have the love for this institution that they will put themselves out there for you to bring your issues, to bring your concerns to the administration, to the Board of Trustees. And that's not an easy job. It's not easy to lead amongst your peers because of some of the criticism that you sometimes receive and the second guessing that often happens. But these young men are standing, they're standing tall, and they deserve a much better round of applause for representing you, the student body. So if you would, join me in a more robust round of applause for these gentlemen. Thank you. Thank you, gentlemen. Thank you indeed. At this time, it is my pleasure to introduce a young brother who we all know, who I enjoy talking to, the one with the debater, debate in his spirit. Ladies and gentlemen, our esteemed Vice President of the Student Government Association, Mr. Dijon Hall. Good morning, gentlemen. Raised in the town of Denmark, South Carolina, Bakari T. Sellers is a product of the proverb, it takes a village to raise a child. Growing up the son of Dr. and Mrs. Cleveland Sellers, Bakari has always been involved in local community activism. After graduating from Morehouse College in 2005, where he served as the Student Government Association Vice, I'm sorry, Student Government Association President, he went on to receive, to receive his Juris Doctorate from the University of South Carolina School of Law. Bakari began his journey in the realm of politics by working for Congressman James Clyburn, Mayor Shirley Franklin, and the Southeastern Regional Director of the NAACP. At the age of 27, Brother Sellers is an associate at the Strom Law Firm and represents District 90 in the South Carolina General Assembly. Brothers, please welcome one of Time Magazine's 40 Under 40, Representative Bakari T. Sellers. Thank you so much um, to Dr. Franklin and Mr. Good Game, my good friend over there, and uh, I see Mr. Oliver back there. I've known him most of my life. Um, to Dr. Bynum um, and to Travis, 
you're, I understand, and we, we always keep up with our SJA presidents, and I understand that you are a very, very, very good SJA president. So I want to I wanna thank all of you all for this invitation to be here today. And I remember my crown forms, um, some of which I slept through, um, some of which I, I just didn't show up to. Um, but in all those crown forms, I never thought that I would be back here speaking before you all today. Um, so it really is a privilege and an honor and every other adjective you can possibly think of to describe how I feel about being back at Morehouse College today. In 2005, I think about it, the year I graduated, George Bush was President of the United States and Shirley Franklin was Mayor of Atlanta. Pope John Paul II had just died. And in July of that year, we had four terror attacks in London, which killed 52 people and injured another 700. And then one month later, Hurricane Katrina made landfall in the Gulf Coast. It signaled the start of a chain of events that would leave nearly 2,000 people dead and an entire nation disenchanted. It's hard not to look back and imagine that this nation, our nation, could let a tragedy like that happen. And I remember at that time being absolutely furious. I wanted to break something or, or punch someone as news started coming out of New Orleans and live pictures found their way to our screens from the Superdome. But I also remember my father talking to me and seeing me so young and so ready to take on the world with my fist if need be. And I remember him telling me to calm down, take a breath, and try to make a difference, not just a demonstration. You see, my father was born to a South Carolina in an America that was very different from the one we know today. He was born to an America of separation, segregation, and degradation. An America that said a black man was worth little more than a mule and a woman was worth even less. An America where the streets bore the scars of segregation and sometimes the trees bore the strange fruit. I can't imagine how that must have been for him. An eager and intelligent young man told that no matter how hard he worked, no matter how well he learned or how much he achieved, he could only ever be one thing a black man. I can't imagine how difficult that must have been, but no matter how many times he heard that he was just wasting his time or that he was just a dreamer, he never believed it. He never believed that this country was so tied up in what it has been that it could not see what it could be. And that's a special kind of faith because it requires you not just to believe in yourself, but believe in the rest of us as well, to believe that we as a people, as a nation, will not let inequality stand that we will not let injustice prevail, that we will strive to be better than we are, to do better than we have, to have faith in one another, and even more importantly, love our neighbors, even if they don't love us. And that's a special kind of faith. But men of faith are oftentimes challenged with disappointment and despair, and my father was no exception. I've heard all the stories about that cool February night 40 years ago when a group of young students gathered at South Carolina State College just as we have gathered here today. They gathered with a singular cause and for a common good. I've heard how they raised their voices in unison, hoping to draw attention to one of the last vestiges of discrimination in Little Orangeburg, South Carolina, a small whites-only bowling alley. The history books call it Jim Crow's final hiding place. And so they had their demonstration. And as night fell and cool turned to cold, they built bonfires and they sang protest hymns. And they were filled with their faith without fear because they felt safe in their numbers, in their communion, because they couldn't have imagined what would happen next. They couldn't imagine that the state police who positioned themselves along the embankment of Highway 601 in front of their loved, beloved campus would close ranks like they did. They didn't foresee that those shotguns were loaded with deadly double-out buckshots. They didn't know that they would be turned on them with deadly intent. They couldn't have guessed that for the next eight seconds, 1,001, 1,002, 1,003, 1,004, 5, 6, 7, 8, shots were fired. And it pushed their faith to fracture, and it changed their lives forever. Only eight seconds to turn, the fires crackled to the zap and zip of gunfire. The sparkling embers that were doting the night's air turned to murderous lead, ripping into the backs, the buttocks, and the bottom of their feet as they ran for cover. That night of hope and change turned to desperation and despair. The freedom songs turned to screams. Only eight seconds and lives were forever altered and dreams were forever deferred. 
Eight seconds and when the dust and smoke cleared, Henry Smith, Samuel Hammond and Delano Middleton were dead while 27 others were injured and only one man was left to feel the full weight of the blame. You see, my father was only 23 years old when he and the Student Nonviolent Coordinating Committee helped organize that protest that night. And though he'd been organizing marches and sit-ins since he was 15 years old, he couldn't have guessed that a night that saw so much bloodshed would end with him, still wounded from the massacre, shot in his shoulder, paraded by the authorities on the steps of the city jail. And today, 43 years later, he remains the only person ever in prison as a result of that night's violence. And some of my lawyers up here, I challenge you all to help me. He was charged, tried, and convicted. He became the only one-man riot in the history of this country. On that night, injustice left mothers without their sons. It left my sister born without her father. And it left the pages of my state's history stained red with blood. And we have lost so much. But again, men of faith are oftentimes challenged with disappointment and despair. I can't imagine how it must have been for him to see a moment of so much promise shattered in eight seconds and know that he was born to an America that allowed it to happen, that washed away the blood and overwrote the history, that has allowed more than 43 years to let the guilty go unpunished. I can't imagine how it must have been for him. And sometimes it's hard to look at him and not see the horror of that night written in his expression. It's hard not to see the sadness and the tragedy written in the lines of his face. But then he smiles. And he smiles because despite all the violence and the bloodshed, he never turned to resentment. Even though he could have lashed out with righteous anger against his enemies, his state and his country, he chose instead to keep believing in what Abraham Lincoln called the better angels of our nature. He could have given up, but he kept the faith. And that's what a hero does. Now looking back through that stretch of history, from that moment to this, we can see the cumulative effect my father and all those heroes like him have had on our American landscape. I mean, think about it. The same system that sent my father to jail sent me to the state house. We have gone from fearing the law to writing it. The agitator's son is now a legislator. Where else in the world can that kind of transformation happen in just one generation? And it's more than that. It's more than a 43-year line. Look at what's happened all across this country in six years since I left Morehouse College with a degree and a dream. Look at this new generation of young black leaders rising up all around us. I'm talking about Mayor Anthony Fox of Charlotte, North Carolina, who at 38 years old is not only the youngest mayor in the history of the city, but he's set to stand on the national stage next year when the Democratic National Convention comes to town. I'm talking about Mayor Steve Benjamin, the first black mayor of the capital of South Carolina, whose grassroots movement drove a record turnout to the polls in 2010 and elected him despite six opponents in the Confederate flag's ever-present shadow. Look at Newark's Mayor Cory Brooker or my good friend Atlanta Mayor Kasim Reed. Look at NAACP President Benjamin Jealous, Massachusetts Governor DePaul Patrick, Maryland's Congresswoman Donna Everts, and myself. Look at our President of the United States. Look at our heroes and then try to tell me what my people can and cannot do. I say we can do anything we want. I say we can do anything we want if we work for it, Travis, and that means you. Because when W.E.B. Du Bois talked about the talented 10th rising to become leaders of their race in the world, he was talking about you. Your education, the tools and the skills you're gaining here at Morehouse, the experiences you have accumulated throughout your lives, we need it more now than you could possibly imagine. We don't need followers, we need heroes. We can do anything we want if we work for it. Folks, and there's a lot of work to be done, but too often we get distracted. And we get sidetracked by pundits and personalities, black and white, decrying the inequities that surround us. They always raise these serious questions, but offer no answers, no alternatives, no creative solutions to the serious problems we face, not just as black America, but as the United States of America. And why should they? Tavis Smiley and Roland Martin, Al Sharpton, Cornell West, etc., are not courting controversy so they can balance the federal budget. They don't need progress. They need sales and ratings. I understand they have a role to play, and I can see they have a job to do, but it's just not the job we need done. The real fight isn't on the sound stage or in the recording booth. It's in the voting booth. It's in the corridors of Congress. 
in our state legislators and city halls. It's on our streets knocking on doors and handing out flyers. It's not that I believe somehow that the dream we were all raised to hold in our hearts has finally come true. In fact, if you were under some illusion that the promise of equality that our families marched for, fought for, prayed for, cried for, and died for has finally come to pass, let me cure you of that misconception right now. This is not a post-racial America, and there are people out there who will not wish you well. They are rooting for you to fail, and they won't congratulate you when you succeed. And some will say you're too young, as they said I was. Some will say you're too ambitious, and some will say you don't really understand how the world works. For some, it's because you're black, <laughs> and we all know there's no escaping that. But for others, it's because you're not black enough. It's because you're too smart for your own good or because you're so eager to move forward that you forgot where you came from. But black or white, the reason they fought so hard is become, because someone convinced them a long time ago that the only way you rise to the top is by holding everyone else down. But that's what happens when you fight over the crumbs of society. You forget all about the pie. But we think bigger than that. We really do. We don't just see things as they are and say why. We dream of things that never were and ask why not. Again, we can do anything we want if we work for it. And folks, there's a lot of work left to be done. Right here in the land of hopes and dreams, black families are nearly three times more likely to live in poverty than white families. White unemployment is nearly half of what it is in African American communities. Teen pregnancy and drug addiction all disproportionately affect our communities at home. Black Americans are 60% less likely to have a college degree and 42% less likely to have health insurance. And even more sad, we're 447% more likely to go to prison and 521% more likely to be murdered than our white counterparts. Right now in my great state of South Carolina, infant mortality rates are more than twice as high for black children than white. We're talking about babies dying before they reach their first birthday. In other words, a child has a better chance of survival being born in Grenada, Panama, Botswana, or Cuba than being born black in South Carolina. But it doesn't have to be that way. Right here in this room, we have the intellect and the talent to change it and make a difference in our time that will echo across the generation. Right here, right now, we can do absolutely anything we want. All we have to do is try. And rather than curse the darkness, light a candle to shine. And as a beacon of faith and hope, and charity for all to see. I remember when I was SJ president at Morehouse College. I remember my election. <laughs> um, some of the administration remembers my election as well. I, I ran not one election. Um, I ran not two elections. I didn't even run three. I had to run four times within a three, four week span to become SJ president. And I remember working extremely hard that year, not knowing what I was doing, but just working hard to make this campus just a little bit better place than when I got here. And when I left Morehouse, when I graduated, I showed up late for graduation. <laughs> I got there right before they called my name. My mom was livid. And when I got to graduation in the pouring down rain outside, I just thought that I was gonna go out and change the world. And so I decided in that summer I was going to run for the South Carolina House of Representatives. And I was in the kitchen one day with my parents. And I told my, my mom I was going to run for office. And my mom said she would vote for me. My dad said he'd think about it. And I knew I had a long way to go. But all I had in my heart was a dream. And all I had was the belief that I could change the world. And every day when I wake up, I think about what my administration taught me, what my teachers taught me. And what the greatest educator of all time said. And all things that you do, you do them so well that no man living dead or yet to be born can do them better. Beat Clark. God bless you all. Thank you. Uh, Representative Sellers, will you join me at the podium again? Again, my name is Chad Foster, Senior Student Trustee for the Student Government Association. 
And on behalf of Morehouse College and the Student Government Association, we'd like to present you with this token of our appreciation. Thank you, guys. Thank you. Folks, closing remarks will be quite short. During my now third year here at Morehouse, I've had a lot of proud moments on the campus. Matter of fact, they happen almost daily, uh, be that in things that I observe in a student body, activities that I'm involved in, or things that the alumni of Morehouse have accomplished. Yesterday, the young men of Morehouse made us proud during our AUC career fair. And in talking to some of the employers, they said there was a distinct, there was something distinct about the men of Morehouse. And they could tell the difference the way the men of Morehouse presented themselves during that AUC career fair than other students presented themselves. And so we thank you, brothers, for that proud, very proud moment. Well, a couple of weeks ago, we all had, the, a lot of us had the privilege of traveling to Washington, D.C. to participate in the nation's football classic. And it was a very proud moment for the college, although we didn't quite get the outcome that we wanted. But in the stands, in the crowd, the events D.C. people, when you looked around, there was a sea of maroon. There was a sea of maroon. It was clear that Morehouse was in the house abundantly. Well, ladies and gentlemen, Representative Bakari Seller just said something that I need you to remind. Remember, tonight, 8 o'clock p.m., B.T. Harvey Stadium, Clark Atlanta University, comes to our house. And when they're in our house, we want to make sure that tonight we replicate that sea of maroon. So we're calling brothers and our sisters over at Spellman. We're calling for a maroon out. Oh, yeah. Now, in order to be able to participate in that maroon out, we need to make sure you stop by ID control and get that sticker so that you can get into the game tonight. But we want a sea of maroon, gentlemen. We want a sea of maroon, so we want you to arrive on time for 8 o'clock kickoff. We want you to be there in force, and we want you to cheer loudly as our maroon tigers take on the Clark Atlanta University Panthers. Now, let me get your attention just a second. Settle down for me, brothers. Now, we want you to be ferocious and cheer like you haven't cheered before. And we're sure the outcome will be in our favor. And we know that this particular game called the Battle on the Yard is for bragging rights. And we know our Maroon Tigers are going to do a good job at making sure that we have bragging rights once again here in the AUC. And we know that you're going to go back and forth with your Clark Atlanta University, uh, Clark Atlanta University counterparts in some good fun rivalry. But between 10 and 11 o'clock when that game ends, it's unity once again, folks. It's unity in the AUC once again. Now, we're going to continue to talk and brag and do all those good things, but we're going to be men of Morehouse, and we're going to show that we have class, that we have humility, but we're going to let them know who run the yard, though, right? All right. So, gentlemen, if you would now, in preparation for tonight, of course, join us, lock up as we sing the alma mater. Gentlemen, uh, excuse me, gentlemen, those of you who want to meet Representative Bakari Sellers, he will stick around uh, here after we break to answer questions and interact with some of your brothers who want to speak to Representative Bakari Sellers. It's game day, brothers. Sing like you know your hymn. Dear 